Welcome to this Aaron Locker quick start. Uh, check out the documentation when you can because there's a lot of useful information in there, including information about whitelisting in general and whitelisting strategies, introduction to AppLocker, introduction to Aaron Locker, and the approach it takes to application whitelisting. But for this quick start, we're going to get straight into the operations and building the first rule set how to set up, including setting up PowerShell and getting access check installed. And uh, we're going to skip all that. We're going to get to the part where we find the user writable directories that we're going to block execution from. So let's get straight to that. So as I said, uh, first of all, you need to have the Aaron Locker scripts on your machine. So just download them and put them on your machine. You need to have PowerShell running in a way that can run scripts. And so the way to do that is to run set execution policy remote signed or more relaxed and there you go another thing you're going to need to perform the initial scans for user writable directories is sysinternals access check you need to download that it does not come with Aaron Locker the easiest way to download it is to run the script download access check from the support directory of Aaron Locker and it downloads the latest copy straight from the web and now we can use it to do the initial scan. The initial scan, all we really care about is identifying the user writable subdirectories of the Windows and Program Files directories. Run Create Policies, and it will immediately start scanning those directories. It will also perform some other steps, which we don't care about at this time, so we'll come back to those later. Okay, so it's already enumerated the writable directories, so let's go see what it found. In the Scan Results directory, we've got some XML files and some text files. The XML files are the full results listing all the user writable subdirectories as well as what accounts have been granted access to them. So for example, under the Windows directory, we've got uh, Windows Tasks, Windows Temp, uh, and the entities that it's been granted access to. This is also going to include some redundant information because we have C colon Windows Temp and then later we'll have a bunch of subdirectories of Windows Temp. When we block an, um, execution from those user writable directories, as long as we cover C colon Windows Temp, we don't need to specify every single subdirectory, and that's what these text files do. So here's a collapsed version of that, including uh, Windows Temp and everything underneath it. For some of these, we also need to block not just the files and subdirectories, but also alternate data streams of the directories. And that's what the colon star does. So that's the Windows directory. By default, the program files and program files x86 directories do not contain any user writable subdirectories, but after you install some apps, you might find that they do. This one, uh, program files doesn't. Program files x86, this has Google Chrome installed on it, and it's got Google Chrome application setup metrics directory, which grants write permissions to authenticated users. That's probably because they're using a single directory for any user on the computer to be able to write some uh, metrics that can pr presumably be uploaded. The thing is, as long as there's no executables in that directory, then we don't need to worry about having to create special rules to allow executables in there to run. One way to find out is to run scan directories. The scan directories script will analyze a variety of directories looking for user writable uh, files that uh, we need to grant permissions for uh, to allow them to execute. So let's do, uh, we'll look at the writable directories under the Windows directory and program files and let's write it out to Excel. And here we're finding that there are, in all of those writable subdirectories, there are no files that we need to create rules for. There's no scripts, uh, executables, DLLs, MSIs, etc. So we're good there. However, we might be interested in other directories. So for example, non-default directories. Are there any non-default directories such as, yes, C colon apps? is a directory that might contain something that's where people put stuff from time to time so let's have a look in that directory directories to search c colon apps 
and let's write the results to Excel. Okay, so what we have here is these are all uh, files in C colon apps. Uh, this is an unsafe directory, meaning it's user writable, meaning if we grant the ability for users to be able to run anything they want out of C colon apps, they could just download anything they want there and then run it. So what we wanna do is if we want to allow these programs that are uh, in this directory to run, we need to create special rules for them. And we'll go back and see how to do that. Another option we have is to search for program data. Search program data and write it to Excel because it makes it a lot easier. And here we see that there's a combination of safe directories and unsafe directories. We can filter on those if we want. We can dig in and find out, yes, Windows Defender has put a bunch of their binaries in uh, under program data, but they're all under safe directories. So we can create a path rule saying allow execution from these directories. So now we've got the ability to allow execution from the Windows and Program Files directory minus the user writable subdirectories. There's additional customizations we need to make, and all those can be specified in the customization inputs directory. There's a bunch of PS1 files in there. One that we want to look at is get safe paths to allow. This is the one where we can specify safe directories, directories that are not user writable, that contain executables we want to allow. All we need to do here is specify the name of the, the path to the directory and output that. So for example, here, we know that program data Microsoft Windows Defender is going to contain executables that non-admins need to be able to run and non-admins cannot modify what's in there. So we just specify that path and produce that, uh, that path with the script and that's all there is to it. The fragment up here looks for whether the computer is uh, domain joined. And if so, it grants the ability to execute from the net logon and sysvol shares from the domain controllers. We don't need to make any modifications based on what we've been seeing here. For unsafe paths, paths that are user writable, we need to do a little bit more. So uh, what we're going to do is specify uh, the path we want to allow execution from, the existing executables or newer versions, not anything that happens to be in there. We're going to generate publisher and hash rules, uh, depending on whether they're signed or not. And to do that, all we need to do is give it a label. So we'll call these custom apps and paths that need to be inspected. We have right above it, we've got right here, we've got uh, Microsoft OneDrive, which is in the user profile. We've got C colon apps, which is where we're allowing execution of the known executables, known and trusted executables that happen to be in there now. And we're not going to enforce uh, version checks on them. We just want to check, are they the versions that we allowed or signed versions that are newer than the ones that we've approved? And that's all we need to do there. So we save that. Trusted signers is if we have a publisher that we trust everything by that publisher, for example, uh, Google Chrome um, or something like that, we can just put in some rules like that. Uh, this will also load up this additional directory here, this additional script here, the output of trusted signers, MSVC, MFC. And what that'll do is allow us to execute these redistributables that often come with, with programs. That's all we're gonna need to do at this point. So all we need to do now is with the modifications we've made to customization inputs is to go ahead and regenerate the policies. And while we're at it, let's make Excel documentation about these. You'll notice here, this went very quickly because it's not rescanning the Windows and Program Files subdirectories because it's already done so. We can force a rescan by specifying rescan when we run create policies, but we're not going to here. So what we end up with are two, two rules uh, or two rule sets. We've got audit and we've got enforce. 
They're identical otherwise. And we've generated corresponding uh, uh, Excel documentation for each of them. So let's have a look at the enforce document. And we can see here, collapse this up. You can see here uh, the file types. We can filter on these if we want to look at things specifically. We can look for whether they are audit or uh, enforce. Uh, the different rule types. So we've got hash path and publisher rules. Uh, who it's applied to. Oh, and by the way, there's one rule applied to creator owner, which never actually takes effect at any time because nobody ever runs as creator owner. But this rule specifies the timestamp. So you can know when this rule set was actually created and you can go back and find the rule, uh, the, the policy XML that went with it. That might be useful at some point. We can see here that uh, we are granting the ability for administrators to run any type of file from anywhere, while everyone else is restricted to allowing, for example, executables from the program files directory minus these subdirectories, and from the Windows directory minus these subdirectories, etc. For custom apps, let's find that. Um, if we look under name and custom apps. So we search for everything beginning with the label custom apps. These are the rules that were generated uh, when we specified in unsafe paths. Uh, we are granting the ability to run policy analyzer, Lua bug light, uh, some DLLs, actually no DLLs, I'm sorry, some EXEs, they're all EXEs, never mind. Okay, so the next step is to apply these rules. You can do it through Active Directory group policy or through local group policy. For local, there's a local configuration directory here. And if we do configure for AppLocker, I've already configured for AppLocker, so I can't do it again. Apply policy to local GPO. By default, this will just take the most recent enforce policy and apply it to local policy. If we look at local security now, and go to application control, app locker, you can see all the rules have been generated. With descriptive labels that also specify where it actually found the executable. And there, by the way, is your timestamp rule. And that's basically the quick start.